for the hastening of the reappearance, the return of the Savior, the Avenger, the Master, Al Hujjat ibn al Hassan al Askari, recite Allah with salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> It's the day Imam al Hussein is about to begin his journey towards Karbala. He's on sacred grounds in the holy city of Mecca. There's a lot of talk, a lot of discussions as to what the Imam is going to do, whether he's actually headed towards Kufa, the Kufans are not known for their loyalty, for keeping their word. So the Imam delivers a sermon. I read to you a few nights ago portions of that sermon in which the Imam delivers to us incredibly insightful messages that explain many of the enigmatic acts that he undertook. The biggest and most important of which was the idea that he is essentially putting himself in harm's way. That he is headed in a direction where he knows he's going to get killed. And that is not something that a normal person would do. If you know that by leaving this room, there's a raging maniac, a psychopath with a gun or a knife, and he intends to kill people, the smart thing to do is to stay inside. The logical position to take is to avoid the danger that you know to be lurking behind those doors. So why is Imam al Hussein doing this? The Imam explains it in a nutshell. I mentioned portions of this sermon. I want to focus on another part of this very short and yet insightful sermon. Where the Imam, remember we said that he says, I know I'm going to get killed and my filaments, my joints, my limbs will be torn apart. The Imam even specifies the location of the massacre. In other words, he's telling them, I know better than any of you what's going to happen. But I'm on a mission and that mission needs to be fulfilled. I even know the location. I know the exact acts, the heinous crimes that will be perpetrated against me and how my honor, my sanctity will be violated. The wolves, the beasts of the desert will tear me apart. They will fill their stomachs and their bags with my limbs. Then he says, I have been given a choice of how I will be killed, and I'm headed in that direction, which tells us that as far as Imam al-Hussein was concerned, when we go through problems in our lives, usually they're a result of providence, they're a result of accidents or things that we would perceive as accidents, right? They're a result of the forces of nature coming together and resulting in those troubles. But in the case of God's proofs, the Ahlul Bayt, the prophets, the messengers, they're given a choice. Do you want to go down this path? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them that choice. They choose to go down the path. They choose to be subjected to all those harms because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to. 
or because Allah promises them certain things in the case of Imam al Hussein, the promise was guidance on mass. The promise was that this religion would be preserved, was that the hard work of the Holy Prophet would be protected. If you would like that religion to be saved from the monkeys that ascended the pulpit of Rasulullah, then this is your choice. Imam al Hussein says, Khuyyirali. I've been given this option, this choice. Masra'un analaqi. And I've made my choice. I'm headed towards my death. Then he says, Ridallah, ridana ahl al bayt. God's pleasure and satisfaction is connected to ours. And we spoke about this concept in the early nights of this majlis, how if your intention is to know whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you, then you have to use the litmus test of the imam of the time. You have to use the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a means of measuring whether God is pleased with you. Then he says, and I want you to focus on this part of the sermon. He says, لَن تَشُذَّ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لُحْمَتُهُ The Prophet, the Imam says, his limbs will not be separated from him. His body parts will return to him fi hadirat al quds In other words, that killing me will not end God's project on this earth. It will not bring to an end the aim of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for humanity. That just because they're going to dismember my body, it will not create a victory for evil. Because ultimately, my limbs will be returned with Rasulullah. They will be given back to the Holy Prophet. Fi hadiratul quds in the garden of, in the sublime garden of paradise. Then he says, These two statements will be the subject of our majlis tonight. He says that when I return to the Holy Prophet, the eyes of the Holy Prophet will rest. The Prophet will rejoice by me being returned to him. And his promise will be fulfilled. What's the Imam talking about here? Let me give you an introduction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this world, this dunya. And the intention from the very beginning wasn't for God to govern with his coercion. By that I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want to force us into submission. He didn't want humanity to be good, law-abiding, submissive creatures of God by sheer brute force. He could have easily done that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could force us into submission without any effort on his part, but he chose not to do that. Instead, what we got was a system, listen very carefully, this has a lot of practical implications. A lot of theoretical problems could be solved. Instead, Allah created a system where He gave us the space to operate with freedom. That freedom isn't absolute. We're still subject to the limitations of space-time. We're still subject to physical laws. We're still subject to the problems and the obstacles that come in our way, right? We're still subject to our genetics. There are lots of things that shape our actions. You can't be whatever you want to be. But ultimately, we were given a sizable space around us in which we could operate with relative freedom. We could make our own choices. If I'm black, I can't be white. 
If I'm white, I can't be black. If I am from a royal lineage, for instance, I can't be someone who's not from a royal lineage, and vice versa. These things I can't change about myself, although people will try. If he's a man, he wants to be a woman. If he's a woman, he wants to be a man. So they will try. But ultimately, we are still limited by these physical laws and by these genetic elements and by environmental elements. However, the choices that we make are our own. I'm sure you can all relate. I choose to either come to this gathering where the best of divine values are honored and celebrated and embraced, or I could go somewhere else where all my intention is to satisfy my base desires. I make a choice. Sometimes the choice is more difficult than others, but ultimately the choice is mine. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want to coerce us. لا إكراه في الدين There is no compulsion in religion. A lot of people misunderstand this verse. They're like, yeah, it just means that I can do whatever I want. That's not what it means. لا إكراه في الدين is indicative. It's an expression of God's meta law of allowing us the choice to either do good or evil. لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقة لم فصام لها والله سميع عليم The choices have been made clear قد تبين الرشد من الغي You know what's right, you know what's wrong And you know that even before you're exposed to religious teachings Because you know it as a result and thanks to an intrinsic nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has embedded in all of you. You have that nature, you have that essence that guides you towards good and allows you to avoid evil. Then religion comes along, prophets, messengers, they all come and they give you reminders that hey, this is wrong, this is good, this is right. So they give you these Reminders to help you navigate life in this world. So, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want to compel us, didn't want to co- coerce us into submission, the result is what? When you don't have, imagine a country or imagine a system of roads where you don't have law enforcement officers, you don't have speed cameras, you don't have highway patrol cars, you don't have police force to enforce the law of the land, what's going to happen? Some people will do the right thing, they'll follow the law, they will ensure that they drive in a manner that is uh, compatible with the right thing, and others will take advantage of the fact that they're not going to be caught. They'll take advantage of the freedom that's been given to them where they can do things without immediate repercussions. Of course there are repercussions. Of course if they drive too fast in an area, they're supposed to drive slower, they might get into an accident, they might die, they might injure someone, they might kill other people. So there's always going to be repercussions. But the lack of immediate repercussions and law enforcement will make some people think that they can operate with impunity and without any effects. And that's exactly what happened in this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a plan. He had a program. He had a set of aims and objectives for this world. But evil took over. People who do not wish to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, delinquents, rebellious individuals took over. And so you had tyrants after tyrants ruling the earth. If you think about it, go back to the time of Adam, all the way to the time of the reappearance of the 12th Imam. 
the periods and the phases in which the right people ruled the world are incredibly fleeting and brief. What can you think of? The times when God's actual vicegerents and proofs were the ones who led humanity and applied God's law and provided justice to the people. What can you think of? You might say the time of the prophet Solomon, for instance, prophet David, the time, the very brief time of the holy prophet, the brief time of Amir al-Mu'mineen, less than four years, right? The majority of the time that we have observed in the history of the world is nothing but oppression, injustice, evil. Why? Because those who are evil and have immoral inclinations will seize the moment and take advantage of the fact that they can do whatever they want without a lightning striking them and destroying them, without God's chastisement coming and obliterating them. They'll take advantage of it. But is that all there is to see in this world? Did God create this world for people like that to rule? Let me give you an example. Imagine you're a philanthropist or you're someone who wants to serve the community. And so you put in the time, you put in the effort, you put in the funds, you put in the money, the endless hours of planning to build a school so that you could educate the next generation. Wonderful initiative with the right intentions and the right syllabus. If you actually do this, you are worthy of much praise and admiration. Imagine you do this. Then a group comes along and these people exploit certain holes in your constitution or they take advantage of legal loopholes to take over the school. They steal it from you. Now, Because they're evil and because they are corrupt, who's going to graduate from this school? People who are good? People who are moral? If the management of the school is corrupt, what do you expect is going to be the end result of the students who studied in that school? And nasu ala dini mulukihim, the hadith says. People subscribe to the religion of their kings, of their rulers. And so what happens is that you're going to end up with corrupt, delinquent, rebellious, evil, immoral people who graduate from this school and the vicious cycle continues. Now imagine someone comes up to you and says, What happened? You built the school, you worked so hard. <clears throat> you had lofty aspirations for this school. You had aims and objectives to educate the community so that the next generation would come out better than the previous one. Look what happened. Your response is going to be what? That I was overpowered. I couldn't do it. They stole it from me. They literally stole the school. So why didn't you fight back? You'll say, I tried. I tried, but I didn't have the resources, I didn't have the money. I tried hiring a lawyer, I tried complaining to the government, I tried all these things. But the other side is stronger, more financially able, more motivated, and vicious. They're ruthless. So what could I do? Now, here's my question. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this world and it ended up in the hands of ruthless, vicious, immoral, unethical tyrants... How do you explain that? Either this was God's plan all along, which obviously that doesn't make any sense. Because remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Adam, He created him and said, Inni ja'alun fil ardi khalifa. I, the reason I'm creating humanity is that I have a vicegerent, a representative on earth, Adam and the subsequent prophets. Some people sometimes misinterpret this verse and say, mankind is God's Khalifa. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. Yazid is God's Khalifa. Adam was God's Khalifa. Sheath was God's Khalifa. Habil was God's Khalifa. The prophets and messengers. 
Not every random person is God's Khalifa. And if that was the intention for the creation of mankind, surely this is contradictory with the reality that we see around us. The fact that the world is taken over by people who are immoral and vicious and ruthless and unjust. So that's not God's objective, for sure. That leaves another explanation, which is that God, na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, was unable to take back what's His and to apply and fulfill His destiny for the world. Just like the one who has his school stolen from him. That obviously doesn't make any sense either. How could you worship a God who is so weak, who is so meek, who is so feeble, who's not able to do what he planned to do to begin with? So it's neither that or this. There is a third possibility. And before I mention it, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create this world so that Fir'aun rules, so that Haman rules, so that Namrud rules, all the way down, so that Qabil kills Habil. He didn't create this world for this purpose. Surely this doesn't add up, it doesn't make any sense. Allah didn't create the world so that the first and the second and Uthman would rule. Look at the way Amir al muminin describes Uthman. In his famous Shakshaqiya sermon, he says, Thumma qama thalithul qawm. The third one got up. Nafijan hudnay. Bayna nathilihi wa mu'talafih. Yakhdimuna maal Allah khadma li ibilin abtatar rabi. The Imam says, The third one rose and took over. And he came with his big heaving breasts. That's how the Imam describes him. He says he came and he spent his time between his father. I'll leave you to read the actual meaning of these words in Khutbah al Shaqshaqiya. The Imam says he spent his days basically between eating and then excreting. Eating and excreting. And him and his family, meaning Bani Umayyah, they came along like a hungry camel who hasn't had food except thorns in the desert. And then suddenly they come across this beautiful, tasty summer foliage, these green grass. The way the camel begins to devour this grass is how the Imam describes the way Bani Umayyah devoured the funds of the Muslim nation. Allah created the world for that, for people like this, so that his proof on earth would be trampled upon by the horse's hooves? Clearly not. Something is not adding up. The answer is this, my dear brothers and sisters. The answer is found in verses in the Quran, like, for instance, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الْصَالِحُونَ We have written from eternity, from the Psalms of David, this isn't exclusive to the Qur'an, the promise of the Savior had been made many, many centuries before that. وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ In the Psalms of David and in the Torah of Musa أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ Surely the earth shall be inherited by who? By those who are righteous, by those who are good. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the world a place of trial and tribulation. A place where a few tyrants will get their chance. They'll be able to wreak a little havoc here and there. They'll be able to corrupt the earth. They'll be able to kill prophets and messengers as well as their children and their families. They'll be able to do these things. They'll be given the chance because it's meant to be a test for you and I. It's meant to sift the good from the bad. 
Yeah, this happens because it's the dunya. There's a video on YouTube where someone goes to a Jewish rabbi and he says to him that Muslims level an accusation against us Jews and they say that the Jews are prophet killers. They've killed their own prophets, the Israelites. So the rabbi's response is, I'm going to plead guilty on that. Yeah, it's true. Jews killed their prophets. Then he mentions a couple of examples. He says the prophet Zachariah, who's mentioned in the Talmud, he says that he came to the Israelites in the temple and he said to them, be good, be moral, don't commit sins. What did they do? They slaughtered him right then and there. And his blood continued to boil for over a hundred years. He said, yeah, we did that to our prophets. And we suffered as a result. The reason the exodus took so long, the reason the temple isn't back being rebuilt, the reason for all of these things that we're suffering from is because of these heinous, vicious acts of aggression and transgression against God and his vicegerents and prophets. He says, I'm going to plead guilty. It's true. All these things have happened because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a meta law. Again, this is key. This helps explain a lot of things. There are laws and then there are meta laws. Laws that govern other laws. One of them is called sunnatul imla wal imhal. It is the sunnah, the tradition, the meta law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give time. He doesn't want to force anybody into submission. He doesn't want to resort to coercion and compulsion. He wants to give people time to express themselves, to show themselves for who they really are, the good and the bad. That's where the test lies. If everybody was being forced at gunpoint to do the right thing, how do you know who's good and who's bad? You have to give them that space. You have to give them the chance, the opportunity to do, to express themselves their true nature has to come out and so yes فَقُتِلَ مَنْ قُتِلَ وَسُبِيَ مَنْ سُبِيَ وَأُقْصِيَ مَنْ أُقْصِي as we read in dua in nudba prophets would be killed messengers would be killed their families they'd be exi- exiled but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a promise لَأَغْلِبَنَّ أَنَا وَرُسُلِي he says, in the end, I, along with my prophets, will win. We will have the final victory. This isn't about Judgment Day. Judgment Day is the ultimate day of reckoning. It is when the record is set. It's done. People go to heaven and hell. Everybody goes to where they're supposed to go. We're talking about this dunya. We're talking about the fact that in this dunya that was created for another purpose, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to emerge as the ultimate victor. How do we know that? Look at the verses of the Qur'an. The earth shall be inherited by the righteous slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not paradise. Those who doubt in the reappearance of the master, the imam of the time. The hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or those who doubt the raj'ah. The return of the most righteous so they could rule this earth with equity and justice and turn it into a mini paradise. What are they going to do with these verses? Or when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, again, I said this last night and the nights before, as believers, you need to know these things. You need to establish a firm foundation for your creed, for your beliefs, so that they become unshakable. So that one misconception from a YouTube video or some tweet or some post somewhere doesn't shake you look at these verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna lanansuru rusulana walladhina amanu fil hayat dunya wa yawma yaqoomu al-ashhad we shall surely verily support and grant victory to our messengers and the believers in this dunya as well as on the day the witnesses rise Allahumma salli Victory has to come in this world. People who lack belief in the Mahdi, 
who don't subscribe to the return of the Savior or who do not connect with him, they don't have a relationship with him, they don't believe in him, they'll have a lot to struggle with. Why? Because they might believe in God and in his prophets and messengers and believe that Islam is a perfect system, it's a lifestyle, it's a way for people to live their lives in, in virtue and morality and all these things. But then the first sign of trouble, the first tragedy, the first oppression, the first injustice, and it'll shake them at their very core. Because they'll be like, hang on a second, why wouldn't God step in? Why wouldn't God intervene? Why wouldn't God, the problem of evil, which by the way, there's a short series, three episodes that I've done last year, called Debunking Atheism. Look it up on YouTube. One of them addresses the problem of evil, which is one of the most common reasons why people abandon religion, mostly Christians. Christians, Jews, and other theists, they abandon faith in God because of the problem of evil. Absolutely without the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant victory to his vicegerents on this earth, the problem of evil makes perfect sense. That's why you need to understand this. When the Israelites were being subjected to the brutality of Pharaoh, when they realized that every newborn son was being slaughtered right after birth, you know what they said? They said, why are we even having families? Or if they had families, why do we have children? Let's stop having children. These children are getting killed. What's the point? A man named Imran, he came and said, no, I have faith in God. Why? Because at the very beginning of the story of Bani Israel in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them this promise. He says, Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We would like to confer favor upon those that have been persecuted in this world, that we are going to make them the leaders, the heirs, the successors. In other words, they will get to rule this world one day. We are Allah is giving them this, this very strong spiritual backing, this moral support. Then he says, لِنُورِيَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَامَانَ The reason we do this isn't just to give you victory, to make you feel happy. It's also because we want to show فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَامَانَ وَجُنُودَهُمَا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَحْذَرُونَ We want to show the evildoers that we won, that Allah wins, that those who believe in Allah and put their trust in Allah will win. They will have the final say. Imran came and said, I believe in God's promise. Yeah, I can see children being beheaded and slaughtered all around me, but I will put my faith in Allah. God gave him Musa. And Musa was saved and protected. How? You know the story. In the most miraculous way. I'll put my faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put your faith in God. This has a practical implication, by the way. The people who say, we don't want more kids, because who's going to feed them? Put your trust in God. Who fed you? Who fed your kids? Who fed your ancestors, your parents? Who provided for them? Who allowed you to be here? This gene pool to survive? Allah did. Why? Why do the opposite of our, what our religion instructs us to do? Rasulullah says, Tanakahu, Tanasalu, fa inni mubahi bikumul umama yom al qiyamati walo bisukt. Have as many children as you can. Have a plan for them, educate them, look after them. We talked about this last night. I don't want to rehash all of that. We're not saying just conceive children and throw them out and have them devoured by the wolves out there. Have YouTube become their teacher and their educator and their entertainer. I'm not saying that, but have as many children as you can and try and educate them and look after them and provide them with the spiritual nourishment that they need. Imran said, I'm going to put my trust in God. Khidr says to Musa, come along with me. They come across this 10-year-old boy 
Khidr pulls out a dagger and slaughters him. Khidr, a prophet of God, kills the boy. Musa understandably freaks out. So how could you do this? Innocent boy. Khidr said to him, this boy will become a tyrant. He's got good parents. God doesn't want for this boy to end up being a tyrant. This is one of those times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws a line and says, no, no, not you, not this. And so I killed him. Instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate his parents. He will give them a girl, according to a hadith of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, Allah will give them a daughter from the lineage of that daughter, 70 prophets were born. Every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes something, He gives something. If you put your trust in Him, nothing will be lost. Nothing. Everything is accounted for. This is other than the reward, the thawab, paradise. In this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after you. Why did I mention this? Because even though ultimately God's vicegerent will return and rule the world, even though victory shall be that of those who are righteous, even though the Mahdi is coming, and that in itself is the most beautiful glad tiding you can give to anybody. Just the other day somebody sent me a message saying that I'm done, I'm tired, I hate my life. I hate all the things that are happening around me. I want to kill myself. I said, wouldn't you love to see Rasulullah? Imagine like if the Prophet was here and you could actually go visit him. Wouldn't you love to meet Amirul Mu'mineen, Fatima al-Zahra? She said, yes. I said, well, the one who epitomizes all of these is coming. Isn't that great news? The one who will come and say, man, أراد أن ينظر إلى رسول الله إلى علي بن أبي طالب إلى الحسن إلى الحسين فها أنا علي ها أنا الحسن ها أنا الحسين He's coming He's coming Don't rush into doing things that you will regret without a shred of doubt He's coming isn't that the most beautiful thing you could be told about the future of humanity, that it's actually bright and beautiful? So, other than the fact that the ultimate victory on this earth will be that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in the midst of this, prior to that happening, there are adjustments being made. We're not left to ourselves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the khidr as well as other prophets, as well as other messengers, as well as agents of Allah are making adjustments. If you put your trust in the khidr, you have not much to worry about. He came to this boat, again along with Musa. They boarded the, the ship or the boat. And he started to damage a part of the boat. So Musa said to him, but why would you do that? There's, these are good people. These are fishermen. They're poor. All they have is their boat. Why would you damage the boat? Khadr said, again, you're jumping to conclusions. There is a king who is stealing and confiscating all of these boats. I'm damaging it slightly here so that he doesn't steal it from them. The king has no clue. That king, the way our lives are adjusted if we put our trust in Khidr. The way things are manipulated in our favor is something you might not notice. Your enemies won't notice. No one around you will notice. But things will work out in your best interest. I'm protecting the boat. I'm protecting the parents as well as the community from this boy who's going to be a tyrant. Put your trust in the Khadr. Put your trust in the Mahdi, brothers and sisters. There is a reason why Imam al-Zaman says, and I'll conclude with this. He says, وَأَكْثِرُوا مِنَ الدُّعَاءِ بِتَعْجِيلِ الْفَرَجِ فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ فَرَجَكُمْ He says, you should always pray 
for relief, for faraj, for the return of the Savior to happen. Because in doing that, Allah will bring you relief. He's not saying that when you pray, the Imam will come and victory will be granted and then you will find your relief. He's saying that the mere dua for the Imam brings you relief. In other words, next time you're in the hospital and you have someone who's sick, someone who needs prayer, instead of praying for them, which of course you can do, pray for the faraj of Imam al zama Next time you have a problem with someone, pray for the faraj of Imam al zama Whenever you experience any hardship, whenever your family, your friends overseas, others go through difficulty and pain, pray for who? The faraj of Imam al zaman فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ فَرَجَكُمْ Put your trust in him and you have nothing to worry about. Tonight, brothers and sisters, is perhaps one of the most difficult in the entire ten nights of Muharram. Because of the subject, the hero, the individual that we commemorate and honor. Let me just give you a few indications, a few glimpses into who Ali al Akbar was. In Kamil Ziyarat, which is one of the most authentic and critical collections of hadith about Imam al Hussein, authored by the student of Shaykh al Kulaini, Shaykh al Islam al Kulaini, and the teacher of Shaykh al Mufid. People are usually identified and evaluated by their teachers or by their students. In this case, Ibn Quluwayh, the author of this book, has both of those credentials to offer. His teacher was al Shaykh al Kulaini, his student was al Shaykh al Mufid, and he's buried right next to the shrine of the Kazimain in Baghdad, next to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far and Imam Muhammad al Jawad. In his book, Kamil al Ziyarat, he mentions a hadith where Imam al Sadiq says that when you're in Karbala, ala rijlay abi abdullah. Go to the area of the shrine of Imam al Hussein where his feet would lie. When you get there, say the following Allahumma bihaq al Hussein ishfi sadr al Hussein. Oh Allah, I ask you in the name of Hussein to bring healing to the heart of Hussein. Why say this near the feet of Imam al Hussein? Because that is where Ali al Akbar is buried. Because the heart of Imam al Hussein was shattered into pieces with the death of his son Ali al Akbar. To the extent that Imam al Sadiq says in a ziyarah of Ali al Akbar, he says, Lem taskun ala qatlika zafratu abik. Let me try and open this up a little bit. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, the problem we have is that we utilize words that with time they erode their true meaning. Sometimes we really have to stop and think and ponder what the Imams are saying in these ziyarat. We rush through the ziyarat, we read it very quickly without contemplation. When somebody receives news of a tragedy, let's say they hear that their father died. It devastates them. But let's say the death was as a result of an earthquake. So they tell them that your father is dead. The devastation, the pain is unspeakable, unimaginable. Then they say the rest of the family is still missing. We don't know where they are. So then two hours later they come and tell them that your mother has also died. And then three hours later they come and say your brothers also their bodies have been excavated. Then they come and say, your children, with every subsequent tragedy, the earlier ones are erased. They're not as painful, they're not as burning as they are, right? Every new tragedy takes away at the earlier ones. Yet Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says that even though Ali al-Akbar was the first member of Bani Hashim 
to die on the plains of Karbala. He was the first person to volunteer, came to his father and asked him for permission before everybody else. Even though he was the first to go, Imam al Hussein never, his pain, his misery, never subsided for him. Which means that he was thinking of Ali al Akbar even on his way back from the Alqami, having seen his brother Abbas get killed after. Even while Aba Abdullah al Hussein held his six month old infant, he was thinking of his son Ali al Akbar. That pain didn't go away. It didn't decrease by an iota. Even when he went to get his nephew Al Qasim, Imam Al Hussein's pain in losing his son Ali Al Akbar was exactly the same. Allahu Akbar. Some have said that they came to Sheikh Ja'far Shushtari, who was one of the maraj' who wrote a famous <coughs> book in which he chronicled the tragedy of Ashura. They came to him <clears throat> and they said to him, Shaykhana, tell us and read to us the maqtal of Imam al Hussein. How did Imam al Hussein get killed? So he read to them the maqtal of Ali al Akbar. They cried. They came back the next day. They said, Shaykhana, tonight could you tell us about how Imam al Hussein was killed? He read to them the maqtal of Ali al Akbar. On the third day they came and they said, tell us how Imam al Hussein was killed. He read to them the maqtal of Ali al Akbar. They said to him, Shaykh, now why? We'd like to hear about how Imam al Hussein was killed. He said, by God, Imam al Hussein was killed when Ali al Akbar was killed. Imam al Hussein turned into a lifeless body after his son Ali al Akbar. Who was Ali al Akbar? Imam al Hadi alayhi salam says in Ziyarat al Nahiyah al Muqaddasah, he says, may Allah raise me to be with you and to join you in paradise. Imam al-Hadi wishes to be joined with Ali al-Akbar. Only Imam al-Hadi, only an infallible Imam gets to appreciate who Ali al-Akbar was. When he came to his father on the day of Ashura, he was the first, as I said, Imam al Hussein immediately gave him permission. With everybody else, the Imam might hesitate. The Imam might talk to them and try and dissuade them. Or the Imam, in the case of Al Qasim, might flat out reject them. But in the case of his son Ali, when he came, the Imam simply looked at him. This is the exact wording of the maqtal. Nadara ilayhi nadara ayasin min. He saw him with a gaze that expressed absolute hopelessness. Imagine a father seeing his son, knowing that he's not going to survive. Nadara ilayhi nadara ayasin min. He looked at him for a while. Thumma arkha aynayhi. The Imam then looked to the ground, he looked away. He could no longer even see his son. As Ali al Akbar headed towards the battlefield, Imam al Hussein then made a prayer. He said, Ya Umar ibn Sa'ad, Qata' Allah rahimak kama qata'ta rahimi. May Allah sever your lineage the same way you severed my lineage. Then the Imam made a dua, a prayer. A dua that Arabs would make in times of absolute desperation was done in this form. The person would hold and grab his beard, look to the sky, meaning that I have no one, I have nothing but you, O oh Allah. Imam al Hussein did that and said, Allahumma shahad ala haula al qum. O oh Allah, bear witness on these people. Faqad baraza ilayhim ghulamun. أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنطقا برسولك. A young man has emerged to them who resembles your prophet more than anyone else, both in his physical appearance as well as the way he speaks, as well as the conduct and his morals and akhlaq. اللهم اشهد على هؤلاء القوم. 
فقد برز إليهم غلام أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنطقا برسولك وإنا كنا إذا اشتقنا لنبيك نظرنا إلى وجهه Whenever I yearn to, for my grandfather, I long to see my grandfather. I would look in this young man's face. <laughs> Ali al Akbar headed into the battlefield. He fought in such a manner that reminded them of Ali ibn Abi Talib, his grandfather. Look at the way he spoke. Look at his epic on the plains of Karbala. Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. Nahnu wa bayt Allah awla bin Nabi. Tallah la yahkum fi ibn al Dai. Both wilaya and bara expressed on the plains of Karbala. I am Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. If you're wondering why I am destroying your army, it is because of who I am. Then he says, By the Lord of the Kaaba, we are closer to Rasulullah. By God, this bastard child will never rule over us. He fought with them with such valor and courage that the entire army started to scream من كثرة من قتل منهم by the sheer number of people that he left dead on the ground. There are things that happened here which I cannot talk about. أجرك الله يا صاحب At some point, Ali ibn al-Akbar came back to his father. This is the exact statement in Bihar al-Anwar. He came to his father saying, Abatah al-Atash. Father, I'm thirsty. Some have said that the reason he came back wasn't to complain, but to give his father an indication that he's still alive. Because Imam al Hussein was dying every time Ali al Akbar was surrounded. How did Imam al Hussein respond to him? He said to him again, this is the exact quote of Bihar al Anwar. He said to him, Habibi, my sweetheart, honey, Ali al Akbar, innama hi sa'a. It'll only be a short time. حتى يأتيك جدك رسول الله فيسقيك بكأسه الأوفى Your grandfather is coming to you. Your grandfather will quench your thirst. You will never be thirsty after that. In other words, Imam Hussein is telling his son, the only way you're going to quench your thirst is if you get killed. Ali al Akbar returned. Ajarakum Allah, ya mu'mineen. The accursed Murrat ibn Munqid struck him on his head. Ali al Akbar lied on the back of his horse. The blood was gushing from his head. It covered the horse's eyes. Instead of heading back to Abu Abdullah's camp, the horse headed into the enemy camp. فأحاطوا به من كل جانب فقطعوه إربا إربا علي الأكبر cried out أبا عليك من السلام Father I have good news for you my salam upon you هذا جدي رسول الله قد سقاني بكأسه الأوفى الذي لا أضبأ بعده أبدا Father 
Don't worry about me anymore. My grandfather just quenched my thirst and he has a message for you. What is it? He says, hurry towards us. My grandson Hussein. Abu Abdullah rushed to his son. Allahu Akbar. They say the enemy forces, they retreated. They walked back like this just to enjoy the sight of Abu Abdullah grieving over his son. The Imam came over to his son Ali on al Akbar. When Imam Al Hussein went to Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas, you've heard that the Imam sat on his knees next to his brother. But in the case of Ali Al Akbar, the Imam threw himself from his horse. He lied down next to his son, Bunaya Ali. على الدنيا بعدك العفا قتل الله قوما قتلوك ما أجرهم على الرحمن لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين With these broken hearts and tearful eyes having cried over the tragedy of the one that made Imam Al-Hussein cry out loud let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allahumma ajjil li waliyika al-faraj Allahumma ajjil li waliyika al-faraj Five times Allahumma ajjil li waliyika al-faraj Allahumma ajjil li waliyika al-faraj Mean it when you say it Allahumma ajjil li waliyika al-faraj Allahumma ajjil li waliyika al-faraj Allahumma ajjalna min ashabihi wa awanih وشيعته ومحبيه I want to hear your ameen ومقوية سلطانه اللهم أرض إمام زماننا عنا اللهم اجعلنا من المنتصرين له اللهم ثبتنا على ولايته اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة أكحل نواظرنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم ارزقنا في الدنيا زيارة الحسين وفي الآخرة شفاعة الحسين إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والعلماء والصالحين والشهداء وخدمة أبي عبد الله الحسين ومن لا يذكرهم ذاكر إلى أرواح موت الحاضرين نهدي لهم ثواب المجلس وثواب سورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات